originally from, not from Maine, are you? No, I mean, I kind of grew up everywhere. I was born in DC, lived in Boston for a little bit, went to school in Vermont and Florida. And then in between, I did some stints in out west, you know. Ah, where did you go to school in Vermont? Uh, University of Vermont. Okay. I went to yep. Green Mountain College my freshman year. Oh, cool. Yeah, <clears throat> it's no longer. <laughs> oh, it's not? <laughs> no, they closed it. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. sad. Same thing happened to uh, Burlington College. Hmm. What year did you graduate? 2016. Okay. Yeah, so you're, you're a newbie. <laughs> That's right. Good. I had a few friends that went to UVM too, but I don't think they're they were in the same grade as you. Ah, well. Yeah. I still go back there every once in a while just to see how the town is progressing. It's changing so much, but yeah. It was a, I went out to um Fort Collins in Colorado and uh mm -hmm. the downtown looked just like Burlington and then I realized that it's the same like landscape or the same designer, this arm. Oh, architect. really? Yeah, it was the same architect. So I'm like, this feels really familiar. And it yeah. was because of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard the same thing about uh, Boulder, Colorado. Their downtown main drag is kind of exactly like Church Street in Burlington. Yeah. Oh, maybe that, maybe I've got the two confused. It wasn't Fort Collins, it was Boulder. But very similar, yeah. Yeah, it is. So you, what are you working on now? Or right? Emerald Ash Borers making its way? All yeah. around here. Yeah, we've been busy the past couple of weeks. We had that detection. I'm sure you got a lot of email blasts yeah. lately. I'll I'll cover that in the topic and in, in the talk. Okay. But um right now we're prepping for the field season. So all of our surveys kind of kick off in about a month. So we're, you know, getting materials shipped in, you know, assigning field duties, that kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah. It's kind <laughs> of the calm before the storm. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. I know. Same here. We're kind of like in the lull before the snow. We still have a lot of snow up here. So oh, really? we're kind of waiting for the field season to start. It's a beautiful day here. <laughs> it is. It's nice and sunny. It's, it is nice. All right. I'm going to let these people in. I see a bunch. Great, we've got still a few more people coming in. Gonna wait a few more minutes. Sure. All right. <clears throat> are you at, are you in Augusta? Are you? I'm actually in Old Town. We have a oh. different office out here. So me and me and the and the other new ent entomologist, uh, Britt, are both based out of here. Well, that's nice. You're not too far then. Yeah. From Dover Foxcroft, that is. But once that's you right. get over the Charleston Hill, it's a whole nother story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, being this far north gives us a little bit, a little bit longer reach, you know, to do those field calls. All right. Well, it's 11:31. We've got some few a few people in. I'm going to. Um, I've just muted everyone. Um, still more people coming in. Um, and then I believe so. Gabe, you have access to admit these folks too. Okay. If when I'm giving my um, introduction, if you wouldn't mind just letting people in as they come along, that would be helpful for me. Sure thing. All right. Thanks. So good morning, everyone. I just wanted to say hello um, and thank you for joining our last of our two Forest Health webinars. We did one last week. Um, it was very successful and um, a nice lunch option for folks to join in. Um, my name is Sarah Robinson. I'm the executive director for the Piscataquis County Soil and Water Conservation District. Just a few housekeeping items. 
we're going to um, remain muted throughout Gabe's presentation and then have an option at the end to have some questions and answers. So if you could please just mute yourself so we're not hearing your barking dog in the background or you breathing, that would be great. Um, and then we'll have our full attention on Gabe and his presentation. And so Gabe comes to us from the Maine uh, Forest Health and Monitoring Division of the Maine Forest Service. And he was just telling me a little bit about himself and he will be covering some of the Emerald Ash Borer field season work that they're they're going to get geared up to do. Um, in addition to identifying forest insects and providing technical services, he is a project lead of the division's light trap survey and the exotic wood borer and bark beetle survey. Um, so he'll be talking to us about some important softwood pests, um, along with the EAB by Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and the spruce budworm. Um, and the hardwood pests, sorry, as, as EAB and spongy moth and brown tail moth, along with including some diseases um, such as the beech leaf disease and European larch and kinker. Um, so he'll also just be letting us know what the current situation in, is in Maine and how the Maine Forest Services um, is managing these issues that are coming up. So again, um, thanks. Thank you to Gabe for joining us and we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Let me share my screen. All right. So. Um, I will skip the introduction then. Uh, I'm Gabe LeMay, entomologist at the Maine Forest Service, um, and we have a lot of good insects and diseases, or bad, I should say, insects and diseases that we have to go over, so I'll just jump right in. Okay, so here's a brief outline. Uh, Sarah already covered these, but we'll go over five different forest insects. Uh, emerald ash borer, brown tail moth, spongy moth, eastern spruce budworm, Hemlock woolly adelgid, and then we'll also go over two in two tree diseases, which include beech leaf and European larch canker. And then for each of these, I'll go over the basic biology, uh, their effects on the environment, their history and spread throughout the region, uh, as well as you know, main forest service uh, detection and monitoring efforts and management solutions that you can by yourself or other people are actively doing. So first up is emerald ash borer, otherwise known as EAB. We love our acronyms here at main forest service. Uh, EAB is a jewel beetle native to Eastern Asia. Its hosts include many different species of ash in the Fraxinus genus, uh, notably not mountain ash, but it is invasive in North America. And this is mainly due to its lack of natural enemies and the lack of resistance in our you know, native ash population. Uh, EAB can quickly reach high population numbers and kill ash trees within five years of the initial infection. And this does vary but the mortality rate is quite high. It's over 90%. So if a tree becomes infested with EAB, chances are it will die without intervention. And the tree dies actually from the tunneling uh, that the beetle does underneath the bark of the tree. We call these galleries. They're just kind of excavations just underneath the bark. And this uh, interrupts the water and nutrient flow of the tree, effectively killing it. So here's the life cycle of EAB. Uh, May through September, eggs are laid in the bark crevices. The larvae will then hatch and go underneath the bark and begin feeding on the plum. It's pretty hard to detect at this point because the eggs are so small. Later on in October and March, October through March, the larvae will continue to feed and excavate in these little galleries. And as you can see, they do get bigger as they progress. Um, and then once they kind of reach their, their final growth size, they'll enter this J shape just inside the xylem and they'll begin pupating in April. Pupation doesn't last that long. In May, the adults will then emerge, um, and the adults will then feed on the ash leaves for about one to two weeks, after which they will then lay eggs, and the cycle will continue on next year. So here are some important signs and symptoms that you should all be aware of. The main one that we look for, at least during the winter, is blonding. That is due to woodpeckers actually attempting to feed on the larvae underneath the bark. And so what they'll do is they'll kind of pick away the outer layer of bark exposing this lighter uh, interior bark portion, and it kind of creates this light side on the side of a tree. This is often on the south side of a tree, just because the beetles like that, uh, that environment a little bit more. And then in the winter, you can actually see the bark. It's shed on the ground. It's very obvious once you know what to look for, uh, but it's less so now that you know the snow is melting. Uh, the other thing that people should be aware of are these D-shaped exit holes. 
These are the adults actually emerging from the outer bark. These D shapes are pretty um, distinctive and characteristic of this group of beetles, the jewel beetles. So if you see something that's round, odds are it's not EAB. Uh, next are these S shaped tunnels that um, I was going over earlier that the beetle makes underneath the bark in the phloem. And this kind of serpentine back and forth, uh, back and forth pattern is very characteristic of EAB. If it's all over the place, probably not EAB, but this is just something to be aware of. Two other things that I'll mention that we um, also see are crown dieback. As you can see in this tree, the upper portions of this tree are you know, dying down, and the tree is attempting to re-sprout via these epicormic shoots from the bottom, from the base. So this tree probably has a pretty severe EAB infestation at this point. And then lastly, we also see bark splitting occasionally. Uh, this is due to the galleries uh, underneath the bark. So a uh, brief history of EAB in the United States. It was first detected in Detroit in 2002. And as you can see, it has continued to spread every year, you know, reaching further towards the Midwest and towards the Northeast and the South even. And I'll mention that there was also a recent detection out West in Oregon. This is an isolated infestation. This happened just last year and uh, everybody out there is doing their best to kind of contain it and manage it as best they can. But here in the East, uh, millions of ash have died so far. And there have been, you know, many different quarantines and management options uh, to try and limit the spread of this and protect our ash. So here's the case in Maine. In 2018, it was first established uh, along the northern border up here in Aroostook. Um, it was later detected in southern Maine as well and has can you, continued to kind of spread throughout this ash belt. This dark green is our, is our uh, population of ash in the state. So last year, uh, 2022, an infestation was found in Waterville and Oakland. And this, in response, uh, there was an emergency order. A new quarantine was uh, made around this zone. But then later this year, actually just you know about a month ago, uh, there was a second or a, a new detection over in Newport. And so in response to this, this entire uh, yellow region is now part of the emergency order. Um, and this is still developing. I'll mention that there are listening sessions for members of the public, anybody who wants to be involved or just kind of give their two cents. There is one, I think this evening, there was one last night too. So be sure to check the Maine Forest Service website if you're interested. But this quarantine includes, you know, anything that can transport EAB. This includes rooted trees, logs, untreated firewood, and timber. And so here are some of the potential losses, you know, Besides just a loss of food uh, for wildlife, these ash trees uh, could, the loss of them could impact the hydrology and soil integrity of riparian and wetland areas. And, you know, half a billion ash tree, almost half a billion ash trees over an inch in diameter account for approximately 2% of all trees in Maine. And so this represents about $320 million potential economic impact. And another thing that I'll note is that black ash or brown ash uh, is a key material for traditional basket making. And this is an essential part of the cultural tradition of the Wabanaki people uh, in the region. So, you know, there's also cultural risks aside from just, you know, the economic. So what is Maine Forest Service doing? We are monitoring EAB heavily. So we have a couple of different trap uh, programs that we run. We have a purple prism trap uh, network, which is this guy right here. Here's a map of our locations. This is a cooperation with uh, USDA APHIS, and this has been running you know, since 2007. So we have, I think, over 200 traps now spread throughout the state. And these are mainly early detection um, efforts. So we're hoping to catch, you know, EAB adults that might be flying around and we just don't know that they're in the environment yet. We also have some green funnel traps that we uh, put out. Both of these are uh, baited with uh, EAB pheromones, so they'll attract the beetle. But even better than that are trap trees. So this is when you Turtle a ash tree, um, but not as um, drastic that it would kill it immediately. So this kind of causes a lot of stress to the tree and the tree will die eventually, but it causes kind of a slow decline. And so as it declines, it kind of acts as a magnet for any EAB that might be in the area um, and just kind of they all gravitate towards that really stressed out tree. That's a really good monitoring tool that we have. And we have a couple of these trees spread throughout the state. But after about a year, we cut them down and see what larvae are inside and you know, destroy them so that they don't, you know, go back out into the environment. We also have a biosurveillance program. Uh, Cerceris fuma penis is a ground dwelling uh, stingless wasp. It is native, but essentially it lives in these little holes 
and it will go out to in, to look for prey. And one of those preys is uh, EAB, in addition to a couple of other group crested beetles. So it'll go out, fetch this, bring it back to its nest. And so what we do is we actually camp out at these nests and intercept the beetle uh, as the wasp is bringing it back. And so we can detect it that way as the wasps are kind of even better at finding EAB than we are. And we have a couple of these different nests that we do monitor throughout the state. So in terms of ash protection, um, one of the major efforts that's going on right now is seed collection. Uh, collecting seed is essential to maintain as much genetic diversity as possible. So once this EA8, EAB outbreak kind of subsides, we'll need a way to restore the forest afterwards. Uh, hopefully ash can bounce back and having ash seed that is genetically resistant to EAB would be ideal. So I think University of Maine just came out with an ash uh, seed collection guide. If anybody's interested, they should go Google that, check it out on their website. We also have a bio, biological control program that we run. There are three species of parasitoid wasp that we've released so far. Here they are down here. Um, and these actually lay their eggs inside the beetle um, or the egg, I believe. And they will ultimately kill that and you know, kind of create a new cycle of life for the wasp, which will then continue to prey upon these beetles. There are some management options available for EAB. Uh, these include systemic pesticides. Uh, emamectin benzoate is one really uh, effective tool that you can apply to trees. Um, I'll mention that some of the formulations are restricted, so you'll have to go through a pesticide applicator uh, to apply that, but one application lasts multiple years. And it's really it's really promising right now. Um, another method is harvesting ash. Obviously, this will depend on your situation, but harvest. some people choose to harvest before EAB. Uh, has infested their trees and others will choose to leave ash in the stand to kind of maintain that population and you know keep ash trees that are resistant to EAB in the environment which can then you know repopulate the forest afterward. And so what you can do uh, you can help report sightings of EAB to Maine Forest Service. Here are a couple of the lookalikes emerald ash borers what you're looking for but we do have a couple of uh, native borers that are not so much of a problem usually which look very similar. Um, but if you see something that looks like emerald ash borer or you see any of the signs and symptoms of it, be sure to go on to maine.gov slash EAB and report a suspect to us so we can follow up with it. So pivoting to a different pest, uh, brown tail moth is one that I'm sure most people are familiar with. This is a defoliating moth from Europe. Uh, it is an invasive pest and it has these uh, cyclic population surges. So Negative effects do occur when it reaches these really high population numbers because the larvae are polyphagous. And that means that they'll basically feed on a number of different hardwood species, most commonly oak uh, and apple, but also hawthorn and a couple others. And one thing that everybody knows about brown tail is that the larvae have microscopic toxic hairs, which cause skin irritation and or problem breathing. So going into this a little bit more, the human nuisance aspect of it is these toxic hairs. They are barbed and they actually inject toxin into the skin or lungs when they stick in you. And these are really pesky because they are carried by the air. You don't necessarily need to just handle the caterpillar. They, you know, become deposited on leaf litter and then they can become airborne again if they're disturbed and they will last up to three years in the environment and still remain toxic. And this does have economic damage, obviously, because Maine is a you know, vacation land. Uh, this does affect our tourism industry, having these toxic hairs in the environment. But in addition to that, it does uh, cause tree damage. So the caterpillars themselves feed on different species of tree, as I mentioned, and they cause branch dieback, uh, greater than 30% defoliation. And tree mortality can occur after only a few years, uh, especially when it's combined with other stressors, other beetles, other diseases in the environment. And this causes economic damage because it affects orchards. As I mentioned, uh, they do feed on apples. And so the apple industry has been affected. And then there's also just high value trees in the environment that are affected as well. So here is the life cycle of the brown tail moth. Uh, July through August, the adults are active. Here's one right here. And they lay these uh, egg masses that are kind of furry. Uh, but then in August and September, these egg masses hatch and the larvae uh, go out and they start skeletonizing leaves. And so this damage is characteristic of this life stage. Uh, they don't actually feed through the leaf itself. They just kind of get the outer green layer, um, but they leave the same structure of the leaf. Once they're done feeding, the larvae will then overwinter in what we call winter webs. These webs are on the outs, 
pretty much outer portions of branches and they're really tightly wound. Uh, I'll go into these in a little more detail in just a bit, but this is where they stay uh, throughout the winter. They're just be emerging right now, actually, uh, but there are tons and tons and tons of larvae inside. In April and June, the larvae begin feeding, and this is when they do their free feeding stage. Basically, they're no longer skeletoniz skeletonizing the leaf. They're just free feeding, eating the whole thing. And this is about when those toxic hairs really become abundant. This is when the caterpillars are most active and they're shedding those hairs like crazy. But then in uh, July, they will cocoon. Uh, and these cocoons are also very hairy. You don't really want to mess with them uh, unless you're feeling brave and wearing gloves. And so how can you recognize these, uh, these webs in the environment? There is uh, one web that often gets confused with them, and that's from the fall webworm. This is a larger web. It's about 6 to 15 inches in diameter. And it is looser, which is the most notable feature. There are no caterpillars inside this one either. Um, and as I said, the leaves aren't really tucked in. They're just kind of caught up in this uh, in this loose webbing. Whereas the brown tail moth has a smaller web and the leaves are tightly wrapped around the caterpillars. And they are kind of at the ends of these branches. So if you see any um, uh, oak trees with leaves still on them, take a closer look. They might have this webbing on them. But they'll be emerging right about now. So here is the history in the United States. Uh, brown tail was introduced in 1897 in um, Massachusetts area. Uh, since then, it has spread rapidly um, and reached a maximum range in 1914, covering a lot of New England. It has since declined uh, due to natural controls, which I'll go into in a little bit, in a little bit later. Um, and by the late 20th century, it was actually limited to just two locations. That would be Cape Cod and a couple islands off of Casco Bay. However, since then, as everyone knows, the population uh, has come back. It continues to kind of surge and recede and surge and recede. And right now we are in the middle of one of those outbreaks. Uh, here's a picture of you know, when they actually used to clip the webs off of the trees back in the old days. So this is a time-honored tradition. Here's the situation today. Our current outbreak began in 2015, as you can see here, and it has just exploded. So. This is part of our Maine Forest Service 2023 winter web survey. Basically, we all go out and we drive around all these roads, these back roads, and we count the number of webs that we see. So every single green dot that you see is at least one web. Uh, we do have you know, different structures in place to kind of capture those large amounts of webs that you'll see. So it looks like the Lewiston area this year is going to be pretty bad, uh, as well as the Bangor area. Uh, and there are some factors that could reduce BTM defoliation. So there are pathogens that affect them. One is fungal, one of them is virus. And these correlate to the environmental conditions. So if you look at this graph, the y-axis is the total defoliation. So that's a good measure of how many caterpillars are actually in the environment, actively feeding, if they're alive. Here we have August and September temperature and May and June precipitation. So uh, at lower August and September temperatures and at higher spring precipitations, we actually see these fungal pathogens and virus pathogens do really well. So we're hoping for kind of a cool wet spring this year, which might help out uh, knocking down those caterpillars. But it's important to note that cold winter temperatures do not necessarily kill brown tail, which is the case with a lot of other insects. If you have like a good, hard, prolonged frost in the winter that can usually make a dent, uh, that's not usually the case with brown tail. So what are the management efforts? Uh, the main thing is winter web clipping. This season is just ending, so it's probably no longer relevant at this point. But for next year, uh, just know that it's always a good idea to clip webs in your yard, but you know, do it safely, do it with gloves, um, and destroy them properly. So dunk them in soapy water, or some people like to burn them. Uh, you can also hire an arborist to do this. Those tops of tree webs can be kind of tricky to get. Uh, and we have a list of uh, services on our website that will do that for you. Now in the spring, it's important to kind of limit the spread of brown tail so you can avoid parking under infested areas. Just protect yourself. Um, let's see. Uh, there are insecticide treatments that you can apply. However, there's very limited number of products that are currently approved in Maine. So be sure to check with the Maine Board of Pesticide Control or contact and contact a licensed pesticide applicator because some of these are restricted use pesticides. However, for the general Homeowner, if you're doing yard work outside, uh, it's best to do it when it's wet out. So just after a rain, that will keep those hairs from becoming airborne when you're raking leaves. Um, and then also, 
be sure to keep your outdoor lights off during the adult flight in the summer. Like all moths or like many moths, they are attracted to light at night. So if you don't want brown tail in your yard, try to avoid uh, attracting those adults. Here are some resources that are available. Uh, we encourage people to call the 211 number for more information if they'd like to talk on the phone, or you can go to uh, the Knockout Brown Tail website. Here we have our Brown Tail Moth dashboard, which has a lot of good data in it. It includes our winter web survey as, as well as some aerial data too of defoliation. So you might get a good sense of where Brown Tail is uh, in your neighborhood. We also have some good videos of how to clip webs and how to detect Brown Tail around you. So be sure to check out that website. I'll have these links at the very end of the presentation, by the way, so no need to rush. So brown tail moth is uh, similar to a couple of other caterpillars that we have in Maine. Here are some of the more common ones. Uh, this one is invasive. However, we have two native uh, caterpillars, eastern tent caterpillar and forest tent caterpillar. Uh, occasionally, forest tent caterpillar can cause outbreaks, but doesn't really have any human health concerns. Um, however, a spongy moth, previously known as gypsy moth, is one that I'm sure people are familiar with. This is invasive and it does have uh, forest health impacts. So moving right along to spongy moth. Spongy moth, as I said, is non-native and it is also a defoliating caterpillar. It was introduced to the United States in 1869 and its history of introduction is actually pretty funny. It was introduced accidentally by someone attempting to reestablish a silk industry in the United States by crossbreeding them with silk moths. Long story short, they got out and now we have to deal with, you know, this pest that has just kind of ravaged the environment throughout the Northeast. The larvae are recognized by these knobs on the side of its head. These are present in all life stages. So if you see a caterpillar with knobs, uh, it could be spongy moth. And you can also double check with these uh, patterns of paired dots on its abdomen. So it has a series of red dots followed by a series of blue dots. And here's an adult, uh, an egg mass, and some pupae, which you might all see together occasionally when an outbreak occurs. So here's the life cycle. Um, July and August, the adults are active, and they begin to lay these egg masses. They're kind of furry. They look kind of like brown tail egg masses, but they'll be laid everywhere. So the Egg masses actually are the ones that overwinter in this species, and you'll see them on the sides of trees, on the sides of houses. Um, they'll be everywhere if there's an outbreak. However, in May, they will hatch, and you'll see these little caterpillars are starting to emerge. And you might be able to see in this picture, but there are little pinpricks in the egg mass. And so if you see pinpricks in an egg mass, that means that the larvae have emerged, and it's no use kind of squishing that egg mass, which you should do if you see that. <laughs> I'll go into that in a little more detail later. Um, but in June, the larvae will continue to feed. They will defoliate the tree that they are on. And then in July, pupation will occur uh, and the adults will merge to lay new eggs. Here are the effects of spongy moth. Uh, as I said, their hosts include many different hardwoods. Uh, the larvae feed mostly on oak, poplar, and gray birch. However, they do occasionally switch to conifers when they grow larger. So often they will deplete their food source on their hardwood and then switch to a new host. And the conifers really don't do well once the spongy moth begin feeding on them. However, most healthy hardwoods can tolerate several years of defoliation. Certain species are uniquely vulnerable, including white ash, which can be killed in a single season. Uh, outbreaks typically occur during favorable conditions. And this is usually followed a few years later by a collapse. So we kind of get these isolated pockets of outbreaks that occur throughout the environment. This isn't necessarily a statewide trend. These are kind of isolated to certain areas. And there are some environmental factors that affect their success. So weather is one really important one. Prolonged sub-zero temperatures can kill the overwintering eggs and heavy rain can then limit the success of feeding caterpillars once they emerge. However, one thing that's good if you're a caterpillar are strong wings, which can carry you to new hosts and spread these outbreaks, outbreaks throughout the environment. But there are also pathogens that affect this species. Uh, there are bacterial, viral, and fungal pathogens, and these are most effective at controlling the populations once they reach these really, really high numbers, and the disease can just kind of spread through really rapidly. So Maine Forest, uh, Maine Forest Service detection and uh, efforts and monitoring. Um, we typically see it throughout the south and central areas of Maine, uh, and more often we now see them in the western area uh, along the New Hampshire border. So you can see there's a couple pockets around here. This is mostly due to uh, their 
hosts being more prevalent. This includes oaks, which prefer the sandy soils in the area. Um, and then we have had some droughts. So when there are droughts, the tree hosts become stressed out and don't really respond as well to feeding damage, and it can be more damaging. So this is our 2022 aerial survey. There's about 52,000 acres of damage. Um, and this population right here along the New Hampshire border, we do have reason to believe, talking to our New Hampshire colleagues, that this is contiguous with a larger outbreak that's happening just over the border. In terms of management, the best thing you can do is scrape those egg masses off before they emerge. So before you see the pinpricks, uh, scrape them into a bucket, fill up with soapy water or burn them. You can also uh, apply barriers to trees once the caterpillars have emerged. Uh, burlap is a really simple and effective one. They kind of get tangled in it. You can also put tanglefoot, which is kind of a sticky barrier. And there are insecticide options as well. Uh, let's see, BTK is pretty effective, um, but it's most effective at, uh, before the final caterpillar growth stage. So moving right along, uh, Eastern spruce budworm is one that I'm sure people have heard about as well, especially since the 1980s. Uh, this is actually a native moth, so this is this is common to the area. Um, we've, it's been here forever, and its larvae do defoliate uh, softwoods, including spruce and firs. So these outbreaks are notorious. They are very vast, and they can just destroy entire you know acres and acres and acres of, of forest. This is their life cycle. In July, the adults are active and they lay these eggs on the needles. This is actually a series of dozens and dozens of eggs. Uh, and once they hatch in August, the eggs, uh, during their first instar, they don't actually eat. So they will molt and then prepare for the winter. And so they overwinter in their second um, instar stage of their larval form. And so these will exist throughout the environment throughout April and then in May, the larvae will emerge and begin feeding. And so this is when they really do a lot of damage. Uh, they will proceed through the remaining instars before pupating, uh, and then the adults will emerge from the pupate in July and start laying eggs again. This is their range. Uh, Eastern spruce budworm is what I'm talking about here. This is a large part of Maine as well as a large part of Canada. And often these flights can begin uh, across the Canadian border. So we do cooperate with uh, Canadian agencies to kind of coordinate our, our efforts to you know, manage these populations and kind of predict where they'll be heading next. So as you, can, as you can see, there is a lot of spillover into the state. And these also work on a cyclic um, pattern. So they have these large dispersal flights to migrate to new hosts, and they operate in roughly a 30 to 60 year interval. So as you can see, the last major outbreak that we've had occurred during the 70s and 80s. So Judging by this graph, I'm sure you can you know, just guess that we are due for one of these that could happen any minute. So here's the current situation. Basically, this is the average spruce bubworm pheromone trap capture at our long-term monitoring sites. And we did see a couple of spikes in the preceding years. So in 2014, we saw a pretty big spike, 2015 as well. And then uh, 2019 or 2020, we did see a large, large number of uh, spruce bubworm in our trap. But since then, it has actually kind of declined. So this is curious, uh, and we'll have to keep monitoring to see uh, what the overall trend is. And so we do that by our pheromone trapping network. So we have uh, about 350 traps spread throughout the state, usually in the northern half where all the conifers are. And this is the trap right here. It's baited with a pheromone to attract the adult stage. This is just an average trap catcher. Uh, capture. We have a lot of specimens to process, and so we go through all together and we kind of tally it up to see how bad it will be this year. And we can only do this with our cooperation of many different public and private cooperators. Uh, we rely on them to, you know, collect the traps and place them uh, and then submit them to us. We also have a few other trapping programs. We have automated pheromone traps. These are run Automatically, obviously, so they can kind of empty themselves and count on a daily basis. And this is really helpful for predicting information about the beginning and end of spruce bugworm flight season. We also have light traps. This is a very long term uh, data set. Basically, this goes back until the 1940s, and we have cooperators across the state who operate these light traps. And we look for a couple of other different moths as well but one of them has been spruce bugworm for pretty much the entire time. And this helps us you know, supplement our other programs 
uh, aside from just spruce bugworm as well. In addition, we also do ground and aerial surveys. Uh, we do spot defoliation from a uh, spruce bugworm via plane. And we mark these on a map and we can kind of get a total area uh, of defoliation. And then this is also followed up with ground detection uh, to kind of monitor the severity of these outbreaks. There is also a larval sampling program. This is when we collect branches that have overwintering larvae on them throughout the winter, which is a great long collection season. So we have a long window to collect data with. And then we do this in cooperation with the Spruce Bugworm Lab at the University of Maine, where basically they process these branches and count the total number of larvae per branch, which is a good indicator of how bad the infestation will be in the following summer. So basically, if you know where it's going to be bad, you can kind of target your efforts of management and apply pesticide in specific areas instead of just broad swaths. So that brings me to management options. Previously, uh, well, let me start over. So this is a large scale problem uh, and in you know treating individual trees is not really feasible. So you have to do aerial applications. And what they used to do back in the 1980s was just kind of broadly spray DDT over large areas. But in the event of integrated pest management, we don't really do that anymore. Um, now it's more targeted and limited. And we also use different products too. So we use Bacillus thuringiensis now. And this is mainly conducted by private timber companies uh, who manage their own forests. But they do that with the help of our monitoring programs. So looking forward, eradication at this point is impossible. It is a native pest anyway. So there will always be a sustainable population. However, there is this outbreak on the horizon. Judging by our data sets that go back, you know, decades, we know that we are due for an outbreak. And so our monitoring efforts will continue and the early detection will be really important at informing our management decisions going forward. All right, let's see. So now we have hemlock woolly adelgid, otherwise known as HWA. This is an interesting insect. It is aphid-like and it can reproduce asexually. So all the individuals are female and they're very genetically similar. It attaches to the underside of hemlock twigs right at the base of the needle, as you can see here, and it does typically target the newer growth. And it appears as this kind of cotton ball. Um, and this is due to the wax filaments that it exudes, uh, mostly for protection, but it is very characteristic and easy to recognize. Uh, this causes tree decline and mortality, mostly due to the siphoning of nutrients, and the needles will turn a grayish green before dropping from the tree, and the limb dieback typically proceeds from the bottom branches and moves upwards. And this weakens the tree and makes it more susceptible to diseases and other insects that might affect it and just causes a kind of cascade decline. So the HWA life cycle begins at the crawler stage. This is the most mobile stage. As you can see here, it actually looks kind of like an avid. Uh, and they are mobile, so they'll crawl around and they'll find a good spot on a branch. And once they do, they will enter our dormant stage due to the hot weather temperatures. And so they'll kind of stop moving and just stay still. Uh, throughout October and December, the second instar nymph uh, secretes that waxy filament. And then in January and March, they do become a full adult, the full cotton swab. And in April and June, the adults will lay eggs and start the cycle all over again. But one interesting thing about HWA is that it actually has two generations per year. So it has this slower overwintering generation, and then it also has just this rapid generation where it just kind of speeds through all of these different stages uh, throughout the summer. And so that's really bad for the, the overall spread of this insect. So going into a little more detail on the crawler stage, this is the one that's usually targeted. Um, it is mobile, so this is the, the highest risk of spread. Um, the other stages really are stationary, so they're only spread throughout the movement of material if a branch gets transferred, transported from one area to another. But the crawler stage is present from mid-March to July, and as you can see, they are very small um, and almost impossible to detect if you don't know what you're looking for. So moving branches, even if they look clean, during this period is really risky. And they are spread pretty easily. Uh, as I said, they can be spread uh, by vehicle, clothing, any kind of pedestrian in a walkway. So if you are a homeowner, the wise thing to do is to prune in the winter before the crawler stage 
uh, to get any branches that might brush up against a vehicle or somebody walking. However, you should definitely avoid work now that the spring has occurred. Uh, this is probably the most risky area time to prune, so avoid hemlock arborist activities through August and February through February. This is the current distribution of HWA in Maine. So it was first detected in 2009, and uh, Maine Forest Service surveying shows that it's you know spread up the coast as well as inland. And so there is an active hemlock quarantine. This affects material with needles and branches, anything that can you know, transport HWA itself. And so if you see signs, including those little cottony balls um, outside of this area, please, please, please uh, be sure to drop us a line, go on the website and report sighting, and we can follow up with it. There are a couple of management options out there. The best thing to do is to maintain hemlock health. Uh, this is essential to allowing the tree to combat the HWA itself. So what you can do is prevent drought stress, which is common in hemlocks because they have such shallow roots. But just be sure that they're getting lots of water and they can fight off HWA themselves. You can also fertilize them, which can increase the tree vigor. However, you don't want to fertilize a tree that actually has an infestation or is near an infestation because that will actually enhance the adulthood survival. It can siphon all those nutrients that you're putting on the ground um, and it will reproduce even better. There are some insecticidal options too. This is mainly for high value ornamental trees because periodic treatment is necessary. We can't really treat entire forests this way. You can use horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps, and there are systemic insecticides as well. However, I will note uh, that there are new limits on neonicotinoids, including imidacloprid. So this is uh, a decision made by the main board of pesticide control. And Neonicotinoids now require a pesticide applicator license and can only be applied under certain exemptions. Uh, so be sure to check out the main board of pesticide control website for the most current information. Uh, this is absolutely necessary if you were thinking about ignoring this option. There is also two biological control options. Laracobius os osacensis. Uh, excuse me, uh, feeds on the winter generation of HWA. It has one generation per year and it can't be bought, unfortunately. And it does target adelgids pretty much exclu exclusively. And Maine Forest Service has released about 2,000 beetles in 2022 uh, in Camden and Mount Desert Isle. You can see a couple of pictures of these beetles. However, there's also a second species, uh, Sassigius skimnus suge, uh, which feeds on both generations of HWA. This also has two generations per year, and it can be bought. Uh, we have facilitated the release of over 100,000 of these beetles, and they are suitable for woodlands, not so much you know, urban or suburb suburban areas. Um, but we have been able to recapture these, which is important because it means that the beetle is persisting in the environment uh, on its own once we release it there. So you do need a permit from Maine uh, in IFW, uh, but if you're interested in doing this, be sure to reach out and we can coordinate some releases. OK, moving into the disease portion of this presentation. Beech leaf disease, otherwise known as BLD. Um, in 2012, it was first reported in Ohio, and it has continued to spread eastward. So in 2021, fairly recently, it was confirmed in Maine. This was in Lincolnville and Waldo County. BLD can kill both American and European species of beech, uh, as well as impacting some Asian species. So here is the map of Maine. Uh, as you can see down there in Waldo County, it's 2021 has continued to spread and just kind of radiate out from there. So the symptoms of BLD are pretty obvious and pretty distinctive. Uh, they are banding of these leaves. As you can see, there's like a dark band in between the veins. And if you were to stand underneath a tree and look upward with the sun uh, behind the tree, you can pretty easily see these bands on the trees, on the leaves. And they are uh, obvious in the winter as well. So if you go out right now and you look for a beech tree that has leaves still on it, you might be able to see these, these bands. BLD can also cause distorted limb, uh, leaf growth, these kind of like puckering and twisting of the leaves. They become kind of leathery, um, but there are a couple of doppelgangers out there. So BLD lookalikes, this is actually due to a mite. This is mite damage. And as you can see, it's a little spottier. Uh, a little different, but just something to be aware of that, that this is not BLD. Uh, you might also see some 
twisting or kind of like wrinkling of the leaves, and this could be due to an aphid. So be sure to turn the leaf over and look for this kind of white, dusty uh, aphid. So the progression of the disease is pretty rapid. Um, it typically starts in the understory beach and is most severe among beach regeneration and sprouts in the understory. Mature beach are killed slowly over several years, and the impacts of beach leaf disease and beach bark disease, which we have in Maine, uh, does remain to be seen. So if you go out and you look at a beech tree and it has kind of these uh, kind of dark growths, uh, kind of like cankers on the side of them, that is beech bark disease. And a lot of people just think beech just looks like that, but it is a disease. Um, and we don't really know how beech leaf disease and beech bark disease will interact with each other to kind of affect the overall health of the tree. So here is a picture of 2021. This is a beach stand in somebody's backyard. And then pretty much exactly a year later, this is what it looks like. So just you know, terrible damage that it can do over the course of just one year. And so what exactly is the causal agent of this disease? So researchers have found a microscopic roundworm, a nematode, uh, which is consistently associated with the disease. And this roundworm, this nematode is native to Japan. But it's likely not that simple. Uh, there's probably some kind of associated factor that we're just not aware of yet. This could be bacteria or fungi. Uh, there still are many unknowns, such as you know how this tiny little worm is able to spread so rapidly throughout the environment. And here are some great images from a recent paper this year. Uh, these are the nematodes in a cross section of the leaf itself. Uh, above is what a normal healthy leaf looks like. So Maine Forest Service continues to monitor and manage this. Uh, we have nine long-term monitoring sites where we track the progression of the disease and how it is spreading throughout the environment. There is also a treatment available, phosphite. It's actually a fertilizer, uh, which can help the tree you know, combat this disease. However, this research is still developing. Uh, a couple of private corporations have their own research trials, and so we're eagerly awaiting uh, the final results on those, but it does seem to be working so far. And so if you do see beech leaf disease, we would encourage you to report it to us. So if you see anything outside of this polygon, um, please, please, please uh, just give us a call um, and we follow up. It might be beech leaf disease, it might not, but it's good to know. We're hoping for every detection that we can find. And so lastly, our uh, the last disease that I'll go over is European large canker disease, otherwise known as ELC. This is a fungal disease um, and it affects the stems and branches of native, native eastern larch, so it's known as tamarack. So in 1927, it was first found in the United States, uh, affecting European larch planted on estates near Boston, and it likely arrived on nursery seedling, seedlings or saplings in the early 1900s, so a little bit earlier. However, by 1965, the eradication efforts were seemingly successful. Uh, repeated surveys and removal of infected trees over several decades seem to have some effect. However, in 1980, ELC was discovered affecting tamarack in Canada. This is in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And then a year later, it was reported to occur just over the border or just near the border uh, by Maine. And so subsequent surveys have found that it also existed in Maine, affecting a couple trees in Washington County. So there is currently a quarantine, it's 84 towns. Um, however, there have been detections outside of this quarantine, so it might need to be revised uh, in the future. So the spore dispersal uh, begins in the very early spring and continues during favorable, i.e. wet conditions. Uh, and these spores can be spread by wind and can travel really long distances. So as you can see here, these spores are very, very, um, or these, these fungal bodies are very small but if you look closely, they're actually emitting all these spores throughout the environment. And the effects are not great. Uh, their multiple stem and branch cankers can result in growth reduction, early mortality, uh, increased risk from damage of other agents, like a lot of these diseases and pests. And it can also cause stem breakage. Uh, once the stem is weakened, it can snap in high wind or heavy snow accumulation. And so they're seemingly very low resistance in our native larch, and there's also a major concern for Western larch, which is a valuable timber species. So Maine Forest Service, as always, continues to monitor and manage. We do try to eradicate it uh, in certain areas. So certain areas of trees, we will trim out the affected cankers. We've removed about 150 in the past two years, and we continue to survey. So 
we look at stands uh, of larch and try to detect these cankers just to know where they are. So we record tree information along with the presence or absence of the disease and winter surveying allows us to access areas that we can't normally um, reach, such as frozen bog areas. We actually just are wrapping up this survey now that all these bogs are starting to thaw. And we collect samples and send them off for genetic testing. This is necessary for identification often because these symptoms can look like other diseases. And so with that, I will wrap up. I think we're approaching an hour, um, but I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'll take your questions. Here are some links that you might find valuable. Uh, Main Forest Service, uh, Think First, Spray Last is the main board of pesticide controls website. Emerald Ash Borer Info has some good EAB information. And as always, don'tmovefireward.org has a lot of good pest information. Oh, Sarah, I think you're muted. I'm muted. I was just telling everyone that they needed to unmute if they had a question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Gabe. I really appreciate your presentation and your time today. Um, if anyone has any other questions, now would be a great time to ask him. It was such a good presentation. I don't know that anyone does. <laughs> you covered so much. Well, I think that that does it. I don't know if anyone has any questions. OK, um, well, feel free to reach out in the future. <laughs> yeah, if you wouldn't mind, could you um, that last slide? I wasn't able to uh, sure, jot sure. down those links. But if you if you want to email them to me so I can do a follow up email and I'll send them to. Um... Oh, there we are. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time today to join Gabe and, and uh, the Soil Water District for this nice overview of um, pests and diseases. And again, Gabe, I really appreciate your time and look forward to possibly partnering with you again. Sure thing. Happy to be here. Well, you have a nice field season. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Okay. Talk <laughs> yeah. To you later. Keep us posted. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Oh.